Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County. We are an inclusive, non-credal fellowship that works for a just community and fosters a lifelong search for spirit, personal spiritual fulfillment. Here at UUCLC, we value making a difference in our lives, our community, and even in the world. I am Janine Reagan, and I'm honored to be your service leader this morning. I will be joined by Reverend Christina Spouty, who will deliver her sermon, Disrupting the Narrative. First, we have announcements. Be sure to ch check out the weekly service bulletin attached to your Sunday service email. There are many UU activities and groups meeting on Zoom this week. Now is the time to make a difference by getting involved in some of these committees and some of these groups. We <clears throat> look for one of them that you have an interest in and just sit in on the Zoom meeting. Many of our groups have been very active even during the pandemic. So I bet you can find one that meets your needs and helps you to make us a better community as well. If you're interested in receiving our weekly bulletin or learning more about us, please send us an email to office at like countyuu.net or leave your email in the chat so we can contact you. <clears throat> also, during our Zoom services, some of you may experience periods when the audio and the video of what you're watching are not quite in sync. Unfortunately, this is due to the device that you're on and the strength of the internet connection that you have at home. Please be patient. Oftentimes it will catch up and become more consistent as you go along. The UUCLC Board of Trustees had previously announced our plans to return to the church for a live service on September 5th, and most of us were quite excited about that happening. However, in light of recent COVID activity, the board has decided to put off our opening until local and national indicators improve. At this point, we have not set a time. We will continue with our virtual Zoom services until we can safely return to our lovely building and be with one another again. We will keep you informed as plans develop. Are there any other announcements? Well, it looks like we don't have any others, so we will move on to our opening words. And this morning, Bernie Greenberg is joining me uh, in opening words by Sherry Woodbury. Got to get him on screen. Out of the din of the city, away from the noise of the crowds, we, we come. come. Rest in this moment, in this place, set apart from the never-ending to-do list, embracing the seventh day, the day of rest. We come, we come to the warmth and stillness of this sacred hour. Remember, you have chosen to be here. Something in your life led you to arrive here now. Whatever tasks and cares await you now for this brief time, simply rest. Allow your soul to be nurtured. Let the waves in your mind and heart gradually subside. As you come home to yourself, holy and whole, come, come let, let us, us worship, worship together. together. Welcome to all of you this morning. If you are visiting for a first time or returning after an absence and are comfortable doing so, please wave your hand. And when you are called on, you can unmute and introduce yourself. Tell us what brought you here today. Do we have any visitors today? I don't see anyone waving, Janine. Thank you, Chris. I also want to welcome Reverend Christina Spouty. She has been with us once before. Reverend Christina is a native of Northeastern Ohio. 
after completing her degree at Kent State University, where she and I have definitely walked some of the same halls, being alumni, where she majored in history, French, and Russian translation. And then she attended Meadville Lombard Theological uh, School, and she has served as a chaplain, as a director of education, and as a minister throughout Northeast Ohio and Pennsylvania. She is currently a three, three quarters time minister for the UU of Tarpon Springs. Among Reverend Christina's passions are intersectionality, working to dismantle systems of oppression, sexuality education, community building, theology, sciences, linguistics, history, and especially learning. She enjoys cross stitch, swimming, and running. We look forward to her message today. Janine, we do have a visitor that has raised her hand, Patty Hope. Did you want to say? Hi, Hi sorry. I was, I, I put it up on my TV screen and I walked away for a minute. But yes, I, I am a visitor. I uh, am a UU. I was very involved in a New Jersey um, um, fellowship for many years. And now I've moved back to, to Florida and am excited about getting involved uh, locally. Welcome, Patty. Thank you. Glad to have you here. <clears throat> and now for our chalice lighting. Bernie's going to give me some help. Why a flaming chalice, the question comes. It's the cup of life, we answer. A cup of blessings overflowing. A cup of water quenched our spirits and thirst. A cup of wine for celebration and dedication. A flame of truth. A, a fire of purification. Oil for anointing and healing. Out of chaos, fear, and relighting fear and horror. Thus was this symbol crafted a generation ago. So may it be for us in these days of uncertainty, of sorrow and rage, a light to warm our souls and guide us home. Lisa Doge. For those who wish to offer a joy, a concern, or a sorrow, this portion of our service is not recorded. And now, now let us take a few moments to sit in silent reflection.
And now, as we bring ourselves back into this time and space, let us turn our attention to this wonderful story from Reverend Christina. Our story today is The Seagull and the Garbage Dump by Aaron McHemrys. Although Max was every inch a seagull with beautiful white feathers, strong wings, and a curved beak made for catching fish, he had never so much as heard of the ocean. Max had always lived in a giant garbage dump on the edge of town. He had learned to soar over vast hills of rotting vegetables and old furniture. His curved beak had never tasted fish aside from what the humans threw in their trash. And by the time it got to the dump, it was hardly ever good enough to eat. Still, life was pretty good for Max. He had plenty of friends. And since the garbage dump was the only world he had ever known, he didn't think it was all that bad. He grew up smart and resourceful like all the seagulls did in the, in the dump. But in some ways, he wasn't like the other birds. He told great jokes and he was deeply kind. The dump was a dangerous place. Life was hard and short. The worst danger was from all the traps and poisoned food left out by the humans who ran the dump. But Max's inborn kindness only deepened in the harsh world of garbage. He saw many of his friends get sick, lose feet, and even die. But instead of hardening him, these difficulties just made his heart grow even bigger and gentler. Max was the only bird who was loved by the rats and gulls alike. But for all the good things in Max's life, he especially loved Thursdays when the trucks came to dump tons of fresh garbage. He always felt like something was missing. He never quite felt at home in the dump, and yet he couldn't imagine a world outside of it. But one day, as Max was sunning himself on the great mound in the middle of the dump, a strange smell wafted by. It was like nothing he had ever smelled before. Fresh, clean, salty. His feathers shivered in recognition. Of what? He didn't know. Max threw himself into the air and glided back and forth, trying to stay with the scent, trying not to lose it whatever it was. Without realizing it, he flew much farther than he had ever flown before. He flew and flew and flew, hardly noticing as the garbage dump vanished behind him. A good while later, the wonderful scent began to get much stronger. Max opened his eyes wide in wonder as a powerful, fresh wind tickled his feathers. How could the air be so soft and sweet? And then, as he flew past one last rise in the earth, before him lay an incredible vista. The setting sun, soft white sand, and miles and miles of waves. Birds he had never seen before danced above the surface of the undulating water. His heart beat hard with a feeling he had never felt before, but later called joy. Max the seagull had found his way to the ocean. He made friends at the ocean side just as he had at the dump, which was a good thing because he quickly discovered he had a lot to learn about being a seagull. He learned how to ride the waves, dive for fish, and 
charm tourists into throwing him tasty breadcrumbs. In the dump, he had looked and sounded like a seagull, but he couldn't be a true seagull as he was born to be until he found his way to the ocean. But something was still missing in Max's almost perfect new world. One evening, as he sat on a post watching a pod of dolphins swim by, he realized what it was. His friends back in the dump had no idea all of this existed. The next morning, Max flew back toward the garbage dump, guided by a much different smell than the one that had led him to the sea. He landed on top of the great stinking mound and was quickly surrounded by old friends. Where on earth have you been? They squawked. Well, you're not going to believe it, but I swear it's all true, he began. And then he told them. The other gulls were very confused. Some of them didn't believe him. Some thought he was crazy, and others were even angry, as if he were trying to trick them. None of them seemed willing to even imagine that there might be another life, a better life beyond the borders they had always known. Plus, Max was different now, and this made them uncomfortable. Still, Everyone was so happy to see him. They presented him with their choicest scraps of trash and invited him to stay the night before flying back to the strange new place he was now calling home. In the darkness that night, a young gull was caught in a terrible trap. She was in a lot of pain and would probably not make it to morning. Max sat beside her and stroked her feathers with his gentle beak. To keep her mind off the pain, he told her all about the ocean and about what seagull life can really be like. As her eyes slowly faded, the crowd of gulls who had gathered to listen were silent and thoughtful. The next morning, Max said goodbye and lifted off to return to the ocean. Three other gulls decided to make the trip with him, and although it was scary at first, they were glad they took this journey. After that, Max continued to spend a lot of time at the seashore, and hard times sometimes found him there just like they did at the dump. But he had changed for good. He was a seagull now, all the way through. He had found the ocean. And for the rest of his life, he flew back and forth between the ocean and the dump, helping other birds find their way. <clears throat> Please join me in reaffirming who we are by reciting together our congregational covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. It is our practice to give generously to our church as we are able and keeping in mind both its meaning in our lives and its impact on the world. We are thankful to all who provide financial support for UUCLC in order to continue our virtual services and to keep our beautiful building protected and ready for our eventual return. We ask for whatever financial support you can provide. There are multiple ways to do this, including clicking on the link in the chat box that's right, that would allow you to do it right now. And we thank you for your donation today. And now fill your heart with the energy of our holy gathering and enjoy the hymn, When Our Heart 
is in a holy place. Our reading comes from Leslie Takahashi. This is Marginal Wisdom. They teach us to read in black and white. Truth is this, the rest, false. You are whole or broken. Who you love is acceptable or not. Life tells its truth in many hues. We are taught to think in either or, to believe the teachings of Jesus or Buddha, to believe in human potential or a power beyond a single will. I am broken or I am powerful. Life embraces multiple truths, speaks of both and of and. We are taught to see in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. Let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins. Let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than monochrome, that a river 
of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, that the margins hold the center. The truth about stories is that there is no single truth, but many. Stories can help us try out ideas and explore aspects of our or others' identities. They can point us to new truths, new realities, or new realizations. Or they can point us to confusion, muck up the waters, or obscure the truth. Stories give us a frame to work in, the familiar beginning, middle, and end, and the protagonist, plotline, and moral. These constructions give shape and form to our ideas and experiences. They can help us make sense of the world and ourselves. Stories may be the one aspect of being human that so far sets us apart from other animals. Stories teach us, comfort us, challenge us, let us experience new things, and find ourselves. Stories have power. They can create new possibilities and destroy others. Maybe the greatest truth about stories is not just that they're all we have, but that we need them. Our fast-paced lives can be really structured. This is helpful for boundaries, for things like managing traffic and following instructions on setting up a new computer. It can even be helpful in other areas beginning and ending your workday, for example. But sometimes we use that structure in ways that can be limiting, constrictive. Think about the gender binary, for example, or like the other day when I went to Verizon to switch carriers. The person who was helping me spent two and a half hours trying to get the SIM card in my phone to work until the person on the tech line, he asked, he called, asked about whether he had tried switching my phone to the eSIM. Boom. Fixed in 90 seconds. But he was so used to the process and it wasn't working that he was sort of stuck in problem-solving mode and skipped option mode. Stories give us space to be creative, to expand our thinking, to help us move outside of that binary thinking we can fall into for so many reasons. Stories help break our focus, our imaginations, our curiosities, letting us explore possibilities we might otherwise never have dreamed of. And we need stories because they help us to know who we are. In the story for all ages, Max the seagull finds himself called by the wind to a place that wasn't his home, but was indeed his home. The garbage dump was all he'd ever known. It was familiar and he loved it. And still, something never quite clicked, right? And one day, the wind brought ocean smells and he can't stop himself from following the scent. It, too, is familiar, even though it's new. In his body, he responds to the scent as it draws it to him, him to it. Despite what he knew of the world, something within told him that this was a part of him, something about who he was and he needed to explore this possibility. So he flew to it and discovered a whole new world for himself, 
and one that was truer than the one that he had known before, even though he never entirely let that one go either. He made space for both to be part of his life, didn't he? That's one of the powers of stories. They show us how we can try new things and learn how to hold them in our lives, to make space for more possibility than it seems we can manage without some imagination. Let's look at the story a little more. So Max, the seagull, discovers life could be different and better. And because he was happier and wanted others to share this happiness, he told them about his experience and others who were curious left what they had known as home to discover it for themselves. One way we can look at this story is that sometimes we know a place and find that even though it's home, we leave for another place and it is even more home to us. Something just clicks. Another way to understand the story is that Sometimes the journey is less about travel and more about discovering our most authentic selves. Making an inward journey. Something like learning to manage our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Knowing when we dive into ourselves to work through a problem that's been causing us difficulty and being the most delightful people we can be to those we love most and best in this world. Discovering new possibilities and what we love, what brings us to life. Or something completely different. One of the gifts of stories is that they can be reframed and used to highlight different things and can be interpreted and reinterpreted in different ways. Stories usually don't have one moral or theme or interpretation, and they continue to teach us new lessons, even after many years. Like the Passover story, more than 3,000 years old now, still offering new interpretations and meanings after all of these years. And the meanings and interpretations and the important parts are going to be different to each person who hears it. There may be some consensus, but there will always be a wide variety of individual, personal interpretations and points of resonance. Stories can be dangerous too, and this happens especially when a story becomes flat, when there is only one interpretation one narrative for understanding. Let me give you an example. Decades ago, when Kodak and other film companies were developing and perfecting their films and solutions, if any of you remember what that stuff is, they developed a strategy that could be used everywhere. What they did was they took a picture of a woman wearing black and white against a gray background and made them into testing cards. These were called Shirley cards because the first woman to pose for this purpose was named Shirley. If the dress in the prints was yellowed or the background was blue or green, the processor would know that something was probably off with the solutions and they needed to tweak them somehow. To help with the contrast, Shirley was a white woman with dark hair. So if Shirley's skin looked more red, this was another cue that there was something wrong with the processing. This was a good strategy, right? There's contrasts and things to look for and a quality control sample. This Shirley card that could be used to evaluate if things looked the way they were supposed to. But for generations, darker-skinned, often black and brown folks, looked terrible. Their coloring wasn't right, coming out all sorts of unnatural hues, 
sometimes much darker or much lighter than they actually were. And pictures of the same person weren't consistent in their coloring, even when taken over the course of minutes. And especially if black or black folks were in pictures with white folks, the black folks would usually turn out very dark and their features were often indistinguishable. To try to correct for this, for a long time, photographers and filmmakers tried to work around this by putting extra lighting on dark-skinned folks. For those of you who might remember Sidney Poitier in the movie In the Heat of the Night, he was sweating so much because lots and lots of extra light had to be thrown on him so that he could sort of appear correctly next to his white counterpart. What happened was that the Shirley cards became a single story. In becoming the standard, the measure for systems operation, the cards made it possible only for light-skinned folks to appear properly in pictures. The story became so singular, was so embedded in the standard that it was years before the standard, the process was questioned and addressed. Now, there is nothing inherently wrong with the Shirley cards. And with this strategy, Kodak used one standard for what was normal for processing colors with its films and solutions. That normal was white, and deviations from that literally made everyone else look bad. Generations of photos and films with people of color, especially darker skinned folks, were distorted because of this standard. Shirley became the single story of what people should look like in pictures or what people were expected to look like in pictures. And the danger was that it didn't make space for everyone to be represented. Maybe this doesn't seem so dangerous, but this is one example of what taking a single story a flattened, one-dimensional story that lacks nuance or doesn't make space for possibility and options, what that can do. And if this can happen with pictures, think about all of the ways in our lives that we may be impacted by single stories. In her TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie says, the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story the only story. Adichie continues in the TED Talk saying, the consequence of a single story is this, it robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. I used to use this insight more regularly before Adichie did what she warned us about not doing, using a single story as if it's the whole truth. She has taken a trans-exclusionary, feminist stance regarding the definition of who is a woman. And while I have found value in her work, as I've said, I would be remiss to not to name the ways we sometimes don't understand how we perpetuate single stories in our lives and in the world. That single stories can destroy. Reduced narratives become stereotypes instead of stories, good or evil, black or white, old or young, male or female, liberal or conservative. They become the false binaries that overwhelmingly populate our lives. It's important to realize that stories are how we make sense of our lives. And so the stories that we tell matter. When the stories are flat, one-dimensional, 
stories that lack nuance, they are problematic. They are problematic because very little, if anything, in our lives is actually that way. Another reason it's problematic is because one reason we tell stories and why they are important is because we need to be able to find ourselves in them. It's easy and we want to identify usually as the protagonist, sometimes with whatever the protagonist is working against, but even that is very simplistic. There was this meme going around on Facebook years ago now and other social media that contrasted extreme wealth and utter poverty in India, pre-COVID. And in this meme, there's a picture of a billboard with a wealthy person on it advertising an extravagant hotel chain. And below the sign, there are people sleeping in the street and tucked under a makeshift shelter. It's dirty. It's easy to look at the picture for most of us and empathize with the poverty we witness, especially in the face of the wealth portrayed on the billboard and what seems like cruel placement of it in a place where people are sleeping on the street. But many of us probably don't identify with either group well. The meme was reframed by a religious educator, colleague of mine, C.B. Beal of Justice and Peace Consulting, as a way of exploring privilege and understanding ourselves in bigger systems. Behind the people on the street, there were two parked cars. C.B. points out that those cars actually represent many of us as car owners, as people with some level of privilege, as people who participate in a capitalist system that allows for such wealth and poverty. When there's a ready binary, especially one that doesn't include us or the people we love, sometimes we need to stop and wonder, stop and ask, where are we? Where do we go? Where am I? in this narrative. I found that if we can't truly identify ourselves in a story or in a narrative, we can't or don't do anything with it. It may replay in our minds over and over as something that's true, but unless we are in the story, it's not ours. And when we perpetuate it, we may be doing harm to ourselves or others. If we can locate ourselves in the story, we can reclaim it and find deeper meaning. When we can find ourselves, the narrative then becomes a tool we can use to tell another story, one that resonates more with what we know to be true, and we can disrupt dangerous narratives. When we can't find ourselves in stories, we have to wonder why that is and what dangerous narrative that story is perpetuating. When we tell stories about the world we know or the world as we know it, we are telling stories about who we are. We need complex stories sometimes because Being human takes many shapes and forms, even if the themes often work out to be similar. We need to tell the stories of our true identities. When we do, we make it possible for others to find themselves too. This is how we find out that we really do belong to the sea, that there is a place for us in the picture. This is how we see the spectrum and the margins, when we can be with the both and the and. Stories have power, and when we are good stewards, 
they offer or create possibility, and the way we tell and use them matters. Because the truth about stories is they're not just all we have, but that we need them to make sense of ourselves and the world. May we use them to bring more compassion and justice to our living. Our closing words come from Jean Harrison Nuyar, who has written in the gift of faith. In the lore of ancient China, there is a story of a philosopher who was asked, where is the road called hope? He replied, it does not exist, but as people move forward upon it, it comes into being. I invite you to continue journeying forward, flying high on the sense of the salty, sweet air, this ever 
widening, ever more powerfully told, storied path called hope with me. Thank you. The flame is extinguished, but not our hope for the future. Our courage in the face of crisis or love we share in all this world. You wanna shout, wanna right sound wrong You can sing about it in a righteous song And if you want a way to raise your voice up high You can be a singer in the justice choir If you are a citizen heavy of heart You can take a tenor or an alto part You can be a flame in a great big fire You can be a singer in the justice choir Sing out, make a better world Make a sound wave like a flag unfurled Sing out like a liberty bell, ring out the truth you tell. Sing out, make it be known, sing like the trumpets of Jericho. Sing out at the tyrant's wall, sing until the last brick falls. Sing about courage in the face of fear, sing about light when the darkness nears. Sing about truth to the shameless lie, sing about freedom in the justice choir. Sing about the weak in the halls of power Sing about the earth in a desperate flower Sing about the poor when the rich conspire Sing about love in the justice choir Sing out, make a better world Make a sound wave like a flag unfurl Sing out like a liberty bell Ring out the truth you tell Sing out, make it be known Sing like the trumpets of Jericho Sing out at the tyrant's ball Sing until the last brick falls if you want to shout, want to write something wrong, you can sing about it in a righteous song. And if you want a way to raise your voice up high, you can be a singer in the Justice Choir. You are now invited to stay on this Zoom meeting for our after-service discussion led by Diane.